Good call. Sorry. <laughs> Let me start over. Uh, my name is Stu Strachan, and I am grateful to be here because most of my time is spent finding great content, you know, curating uh, prayers and stories and quotes that pastors and liturgists can use in worship. And so what I'm grateful for is the opportunity to actually get in and use that same content myself here today. So thank you for letting me be here. And I think it's a really wonderful text that we get to be in at we start a new year. The, uh, as I looked at the, you know, the name of the title, which I didn't come up with, but I'm, I'm following along with, uh, with a, uh, Pastor Ed's uh, sort of plan, this idea of renewal of baptism. And I think one thing that sort of sets us apart, and I am going to read the text in just a moment, but I just wanted to give a little sort of setup here. Uh, one thing that sets us apart as followers of Jesus is that we don't simply look at renewal or new life as something that we do. You know, we don't just decide, I'm going to make a New Year's resolution, and that's going to fix the things that are wrong with me. But rather, we often come to this place where the Holy Spirit actually convicts us of our sin or of a need for change in some significant area. And so for that reason, this text today, um, John the Baptist, right the sort of the outset of Jesus' ministry, is a perfect way to sort of begin the year. And we, to begin the year from a place of repentance. So that's really where we're coming from in this passage. So with that said, uh, would you pray with me as we prepare our hearts to receive God's word? Lord Jesus, uh, a new year has come. And for many of us, that means excitement, but maybe some hesitation. For some of us, that means uh, new opportunities. For others, it might seem like more of the old. Lord, we ask that you would provide a new path for some of us today. A path, Lord, that you would create, that you would sort of draw out before us, Lord that we might be your people, faithful to your call. We pray this in your name. Amen. So our text, as I've already sort of alluded to, comes to us from Mark's gospel. You know, I like to refer to Mark's gospel as the abridged gospel. You know, it's, he gets right to the point. It's action-filled. There's not lots of commentary. But at the same time, we get the, the sort of at the, really at the heart Often, or right at the at sort of the, the marrow of what uh, the gospels, the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. And so, uh, invite you to listen and join along as I read God's word to you from Mark one verses four through eleven. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, John the the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. And the Spirit, descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. I'd like you to imagine with me for a moment. Can you do that? If, you want, if it helps, you can close your eyes. I'd like you to imagine it's evening, 
you've drifted off into a deep sleep. You're pleasantly dreaming when all of a sudden the lights to your room are thrown on as your eyes try to struggle to adjust to the, this infusion of light. You see just as the water starts to get dumped on your face and the water screams down on your head. Now, you are awake, right? Well, interestingly enough, that is sort of the analogy that N.T. Wright, some of you may know, is a great uh, sort of biblical scholar. That is the analogy that he uses when he uh, talks about this text. And I think that's surprising. I think for so much of us, we read the Bible, and it's like, yeah, you know, John the Baptist, he's out in Judea, you know, he's baptizing. But this text, if we really get to the heart of it, and if we can read it with new eyes, is the beginning of something new, right? It's the beginning of a new ministry that is coming, and that John is here to what? To prepare the way, right? So, I think it's interesting, you know, John the Baptist is, is kind of a, a, a crazy guy, right? Like, can, can you imagine, can you imagine, just, just think about this for a minute. I, I heard someone once say, John the Baptist is not someone you bring home for dinner, right? I mean, can you imagine he comes, he comes to the door, he's like, well, I've brought some wild locusts for you to enjoy. Uh, it's just not something you would do. And then he's dressed in camel's hair. I mean, that's not the fashion of the day, guys. Camel hair is not comfortable, as we all know, right? And so he's doing it. It's barely functional, let alone fashionable, right? But he's doing it for one reason, and that is he's a prophet. And the role of the prophet is solely focused on pointing people to their need for God and to place God at the center of their lives. When you look at the story of the biblical prophets, John is, and the the Bible tells us this, some of the other uh, New Testament texts, that John was a quintessential biblical, Hebrew biblical prophet. He does exactly the same kinds of things that Elijah and Ezekiel, uh, some of the others like Nahum, you know, these other amazing prophets did before them. Uh, I found this interesting question, or I have this interesting uh, quote. Some of you have maybe read Eugene Peterson. He's sort of a, a hero of mine. And he's got a great quote about what a prophet is. Because I think sometimes it's a little hard to nail down. And often we assume a prophet is someone who tells sort of a truth of the future. But really, and that sometimes is the case, but really at the heart of a prophet is something different. Let's listen to what he says right here. He says, a prophet lets people know who God is and what he is like, what he says, and what he is doing. A prophet wakes us up from our sleepy complacency so that we see the great and stunning drama that is our existence. And then they pushes us onto the stage, playing parts whether we think we are ready or not. Doesn't that sound like a bucket of water in the middle of the night, kind of? That wake-up call. That's what John the Baptist is up to. But here's a question. (coughs) And maybe you haven't thought of this yet, but this is what us pastors do, is we start to think about the biblical ramifications or the interpretation of all of this, right? We all are aware of this idea of John's ministry of repentance being what? It is, is sort of a a preparation for what Jesus is coming to do. So does that just mean that John's sort of unnecessary for the rest of us? I mean, it's an interesting question to ask, right? Because 
you know, the Holy Spirit's come. Jesus is now reigning in heaven with the Lord. Do we really still need John the Baptist? Do we need the idea of repentance? Well, I would say there's two answers to that. In terms of needing a baptism of repentance, we don't, right? One who is coming, our text tells us, who will baptize not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. Jesus' baptism is the once and for all baptism. We're going to have an opportunity, actually, to renew our baptismal vows as a community this morning, later today. But I would argue that bat- uh, repentance, the, the sort of the primary call of John, is one that we all need to hold on to throughout our lives. Uh, and here's something I found actually quite interesting. It is a, a quote from a Lutheran scholar, and he's answering this question. The question of, do we still need John the Baptist today? And he has a little bit of scholarly language, but just try to hang in there with me, and I think you'll, you'll get something from his words. He says this, he says, far from merely assigning to John a temporal, that is just his time back in, you know, right when he baptized Jesus, and now accomplished task, the church, this this is the early church, the early church recognized him to be the one who will be forever preparing the way, forever preparing the way for Christ, and who, so to speak, stands guard at the frontier of our lives. Isn't that beautiful? Who stands guard at the frontier of our lives. The way to Christ and into the kingdom of God does not merely, is, did not merely at one time in a moment of past history lead through John the Baptist, but it leads once and for all along the path of repentance shown by him. Faith in Christ, in Jesus Christ, is only there where the believer for himself and within himself or herself lets the shift take place in their life. In other words, John the Baptist will continue to be a guide for us as we need to repent each and every day and in which we get to participate each week here in worship. I think one of the the beauties of a more traditional uh, worship service is every week we come and we pray a prayer of confession, which was beautiful this morning. Thank you, Jessica. I don't think that was from my site, so you know I'll have to get that from you later. But we get this opportunity each day and each week and each day personally in our own lives and then each week corporately in worship to say, God, I messed up, I'm sorry, and I want to follow you more, you know, I want to follow you closer each day. And I think there's something beautiful about that, because the the reality is, as human beings, we naturally fall into complacency, don't we? I mean, we fall into times where we're just going through the motions, there's not much thought, uh, it's interesting, actually, if you look at the, the, the neuroscience of habit making, you know, we do something like, something like 40% or 60% of what we do each day is habits. And the reason for that, interestingly enough, is because the brain is lazy. And the brain doesn't like to do hard work if it doesn't have to. And so it creates shortcuts. And those shortcuts are called habits. And oftentimes those habits, sometimes, of course, habits can be uh, beneficial, you know, spiritual disciplines, whatnot. But often those habits, they lead us into these places of complacency, into these places of just missing, missing God's active presence, right? That ice cold bucket of God's presence in our lives. Uh, Many of you know Philip Yancey, kind of local um, biblical writer or uh, Christian writer. He uh, tells a story of in the early days of the Alaskan Highway, you can imagine not completely, uh, you know, concrete, perfect concrete roads. And so these people, these massive tractor trailer trucks would be 
uh, driving, and they would make these indentations, you know, extremely deep. And so what, the, in these gravel roads. And so there was a sign at the, at the very outset of the Alaskan Highway. It said this, choose your rut carefully. You'll be in it for the next 200 miles. What does that mean for us? We often do not choose our ruts carefully, and we fall into a place of complacency, a place of uh, comfort, a place of, yeah, you know, God's got this, and I don't really have to, you know, pray or take the time to get to know him. He's got, you know, grace is, grace is wonderful. There's actually this... Um, famous line, somewhat famous line from history. There was a, a Catherine the Great, I believe, was a Russian uh, prince, a Russian queen. She was German, uh, Germanist descent, but she had, um, she had quite a, um, a, quite prolific appetites as a, as a woman, and her line was this, God forgives, it's what he does. You know, that's not exactly a model of of deep, rich spiritual formation, right? It's, I'm going to let, I'm just going to let God sort of take care of it, and I'm going to do what I want, and then I'm going to get stuck, and I'm going to get into that rut, and not good, not good at all. So what exactly then, we, we've talked about this idea of, uh, of John waking us up out of our spiritual slumber, but he does that in a specific way, right? He does it through a, a baptism of repentance. It says in the text, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So I think for some of us this is a challenge, because the word repentance often can, especially in our culture, it's sort of a, a word we're not so sure about. Maybe we have mixed feelings, maybe ambivalent feelings, you know, do I really want to be the, do I, you know, do I want to focus on shame, and, you know, we have this society that tells us that, you know, the only things that are wrong is to think that anything's wrong, you know what I mean, it's sort of postmodern sort of subjectivity, but I think what the biblical sort of story, the, the sort of the, I guess the worldview, you could say, that we're, we've been handed down, is that sin is real, and sin, if not dealt with, only becomes worse. It's sort of like emotional stuffing, you know? I'm not going to deal with that. I'm not going to, you know, if it's, unless you're upset at someone, you just keep stuffing it. It's only going to get worse. And so there's this very healthy model within, the, within Scripture of when we are doing something wrong to repent. Now, here's something really fascinating. Um, I was, as I was preparing for this message, looking at some of the words in the original Hebrew and the Greek. And in the original Hebrew, the first word um, that was used for this idea of repentance, it had sort of this, the, the, the literal translation was like a deep sigh. You know, I think we all know what that's like when we, we sin. It's like you almost feel it deep down in your bones. Have you, do you guys do you know what I'm talking about? So when you just, you're just like, oh. I can't believe I did that. Now, perhaps in other seasons of the church's life, there was that sort of, uh, that, that sort of feeling of remorse would get twisted into sort of a shame and this sort of prolonged sort of self-flagellation. And I don't think that that's actually a very biblical model for repentance. Because one of the things we know is that, you know, beating ourselves up never solves the problem. It just makes us feel worse, right? And so it's interesting that the, the, the language in Scripture even changes over time. And the prevailing word that sort of got associated with repentance was this idea of turning around, of or, or an idea of return. Does that, does that ring a bell, or does that make, seem to make sense? If you think about the story of the prodigal, right? There's this point when he realizes, why am I living like this? 
I'm, I'm going down this path of death. It's just a path of death. When I could go back and live with my father, even as his, in his, as a servant, right? Wouldn't that be so much better than continuing down this path? You know, interestingly, there's, it reminds me of a verse in Deuteronomy 30. Moses is sort of reinstituting this covenant with his people. They've been, you know, the Israelites, they've been nasty, nasty, wicked. <laughs> they've done all these bad things they've created. Um, you know, made the idol, obviously. Uh, and so this is a- after sort of this period of, of, of sharing the covenant, right? The relationship of promise between God and his people. This is the line uh, that comes to us through Moses that, G- that God is setting forth. He says, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. I think that's quite profound, isn't it? I mean, it sounds in some ways basic, but we see people all of the time, both in our families, in the community, obviously in the news, who are going down paths of death, paths of self-centeredness, paths of self-righteousness, paths of I can do it all and I don't need anyone else to tell me how to live my life. But there's something profound, and I think we all know this, for those of us who follow Jesus, there is something profound in coming to a place of being at the end of ourselves, at the end of our own strength, and we simply come to Jesus and we say, I'm sorry, and I need you, and I can't keep going down this path of death. You know, it says in the text that all of these people in Judea and Jerusalem, they go out into the desert, into the wilderness. And again, I made this joke earlier at the sermon about you don't take John the Baptist home to meet your family, right? And the reason for that is He'd probably offend them all, right? I mean, we don't have uh, the, f- the full text of John's ministry the way we do, I think, in Matthew's gospel, where he, these people have come out to be baptized by him. They're, they're recognizing their own brokenness and their neediness of God. And he says, you brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee the coming wrath? I mean, that's not the kind of welcome we do in worship on a Sunday. Can you imagine the call to worship? You brood of vipers! You heathen! Why have you come to be here? And yet they come. And I think a part of the reason for that is, at heart, they know there's something sick inside of them. And they want to be woken out of that complacency even if it means that ice-cold bucket of water to wake them up and bring them to life again. I said, um, I shared a little bit of that quote about, how are we doing on time here? Can someone give me like a, we need a wrap in a minute? Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. Okay, I'm close. I'm going to go, we might go a few minutes older. Are you guys okay with that? All right, sure. I said there's a second part, uh, or I didn't say earlier, but there's a second part to that definition of a prophet. And I think you're going to just, I mean, it's just, this is just going to land on you from what all of what we said. Again, from Eugene Peterson. He says, a prophet angers us by rejecting our euphemisms and ripping off our disguises. And then, he, and then dragging our heartless attitudes and selfish motives out into the open where everyone sees them for what they are. A prophet makes everything and everyone seem significant and important. Important because God made it, or him or her. Significant because God is actively, right now, using it, or him or her. A prophet makes it difficult 
to continue with a sloppy or selfish life. In other words, prophets are willing to break social conventions. You know, it's not all go along to get along. But what that enables is a heart change that we can't get otherwise. Okay, I'm going to close with this story and try to keep it quick. Because I know we have a lot to do here. We got, we got communion and we've got renewal of vows, so I don't want to take up too much more time. But this, I want to close with this story because it, I think it really kind of captures a lot of what repentance can actually look like in active life. So in 1867, a Swedish chemist, very successful Swedish chemist, woke up, maybe had some breakfast, got out his newspaper, and he did something that few of us ever do. He read his own obituary. True story. I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'll be reading my own obituary. Uh, this man had been quite successful, uh, and he had done this by inventing dynamite, actually. And so he believed that this invention would make war so horrible that it would never happen again. The carnage would be so disastrous that no one in their right mind would be willing to inflict that kind of terror on somebody else. This man was clearly not a Presbyterian, right? I mean, no depravity of man. They did, he did not get that. So unfortunately, as you can probably imagine, it did not work out the way he thought. In fact, lots of people continued to use uh, this dynamite to, to destroy thousands and thousands of lives. And so, as I said, one morning he wakes up, pulls out the newspaper, and it says, uh, he says this. It says, so-and-so, uh, the inventor of dynamite died yesterday, devised a way for more people to be killed in a war than ever before. He died a very rich man. <laughs> and you see, that is actually the obituary for a man named Alfred Nobel, as in the founder of the Nobel Peace Prize. So Alfred Nobel realized that what his legacy was, right? He saw it right there in the obituary. Inventor of dynamite, killed more people than ever before, and he made a lot of money off of it. And so what did he decide to do? He decided to create a fund that continues to go on to this day. And you can actually see this entire building uh, with an image of him in, in this is in Sweden, in um, Stockholm. And so he, he had that conviction, right? He had that realization that his life and his legacy was not what he wanted it to be. And so he dedicated the rest of his life towards peacemaking uh, enterprises. And I just think that's a beautiful image of someone who, and maybe even this wasn't necessarily all his fault. Maybe he was misguided. I think that's a fair thing to say. Are you guys ever misguided about things you think are gonna work out really well? And you know, you have the best of intentions and that paves a road to what, H-E double hockey sticks, right? So we often have these ideas of what is good and right, and they don't go the way they w we want. And then all of a sudden, we're walking down a path that is not life-giving, that is actually giving death, in this case, very literally. And so for Alfred Nobel to then turn this other direction, as the, the verse in Deuteronomy 30 said, to choose the path of life. That's the path that we are called to live. And it's the path that Jesus Christ offers up to us because, of course, John the Baptist prepared the way um, not to, si to simply say we're sorry and we messed up, but to be able to live into and abide in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's not always easy to admit when we are wrong. We would far rather watch other people make mistakes, comment, give advice, 
But the truth is, each one of us is broken in our own unique way and in need of your healing hand that we might turn from a path of death to a path of life, Lord. And so as we go, come to this moment when we get to renew our baptismal vows, Lord, we pray that you might inspire us to turn from any past that, that where there is death and turn to your life. We pray this in your name. Amen.